Sometimes for simple things, we fail to give you the praise and the glory while we are waiting for big things to happen. But it's little, little drops of water that make the mighty ocean. Thank you for being able to stand in your presence without having to look for chair and table. Thank you for strength in the inner man. Thank you for grace you have supplied. Receive all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name and the people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated in his presence. Always remember to give glory and praise to God for small things. If you are not grateful in respect of small things, big things will elude you. If a man is not faithful in that which is little, who is going to entrust great riches and true riches to him? You may be seated. Good morning. God bless you. Amen. 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 Welcome to another session of very interesting and edifying such the scriptures. Today we will continue with part 11 of our series titled The Preeminence of Jesus Christ in His Church. And our focus today will be on the shining stars, the wandering stars within the church, and of course, the falling stars. Say that with me, shining stars. Mm -mm, that doesn't sound good. Shining at uh, shining stairs. Something is still muting your voice. Shining stairs. Uh huh. That sounds better. Wandering stairs. And falling stairs. I hope you know that these are not mere metaphors or the figment of my imagination. The Bible truly contains three types of stars. And I'm not talking about the stars that the astrologers talk about. But those of you who follow Chinese stars, some of you are Pisces. What are the others? Many others like you are Scorpio. And you tend to read those things and believe them. The Bible truly contains these three types of stars, namely shining stars, wandering stars, and falling stars. Humanly speaking, this can be likened to the three types of multitude of descendants that God said Abram or Abram will have. How many types of descendants? Oh, please respond. Yeah. You know, I can easily go down and sit and let somebody lead you in some gyrations so that you are alive. How many types? Yeah. What are these three types of descendants? I said, humanly speaking. The first are the dust of the earth. The dust of the earth. The second, the stars of heaven. I'm announcing them as they are called in the Bible. And the third, the sand which is on the seashore. Three types of descendants that God spoke to Abram about. That the multitudes of those who will come out of Abram will be like the dust of the earth. Then before he mentioned the sand on the seashore, he mentioned the stars of heaven. Let's see this in the Bible. Genesis 13, 14 to 18. Genesis 13. Verse 14 to 18. 
And the Lord said to Abram, after the Lord had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendant as I can hear you as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land, through its land and its weed, for I give it to you. And Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the temporary trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. The second, the stars of heaven. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the hair of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to number them, and it said to him, so shall your descendants be. It will become clearer later that he's talking about stars of heaven in this particular place. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now let's go. For the sand which is on the seashore, at the same time put side by side with the stars of heaven or in heaven. Genesis 22, this was after he offered Isaac unto the Lord. Genesis 22, 15 to 18. Genesis 22, verse 15 to 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as what? As the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. I don't know if you know the implications of this, but I will try to explain I'm sure you know that the dust is the appointed food for the serpent or the devil. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, he accursed more than all, Katu, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust. All the days of your life. And I will put a meeting between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Who is the serpent here? Revelation chapter 12. We need to identify who the serpent is. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And what broke out in heaven? Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. And what was the great dragon? That serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. If you can thoroughly explain to the ungodly, and every man who is here to be regenerated, that God's appointed food for the devil is the dust. A man was made from the dust of the earth. You have already showed them why they have been tormented, afflicted, without cure. Hello. Oh, but don't Christians suffer so? You'll find out as you progress. And sometimes out of 
ignorance, and not knowing how to insist on the things that Christ died for. God's appointed food for the serpent is the dust. And yet, through Abraham will be multitudes like the dust of the earth. How about sand? The sand represents those who build their lives on humanistic philosophies and the ideas of men rather than obeying the word of God they've heard. These are the practitioners of lawlessness. Matthew 7, 21 to 26. If you continue to indulge in lawlessness, you just show who you are. Oh yes, we can trace your lineage to Abraham or Abraham, but we know your type. And you should know your type too. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? This must be sons of Sceva or those who are in the church using the name of the Lord. Anyhow, to gain popularity or to gain their daily living. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to... To who? I will let us show you that the definition of a wise man in this context is a soul winner. By the time you understand these things, nobody, nobody will stop you from reaching out to sinners because they are either going to perish in the mouth and the belly of the serpent or they are going to waste their time building monstrosities that will eventually collapse either in their lifetime or after them. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall. Why? It was founded on the rock. What's the rock there? Revelation of Christ the King. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. If you are not wise, you are foolish. You can't take both. Have you heard about foolish wise man? Or wise foolish man? If he doesn't do them, it will be like a foolish man who built his house where? On the sand. That's it. On humanistic philosophies and ideas of men. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. Whether you build your house on the rock or you build it on the sand, there's nothing you can do to stop the storm, the wind, and the rain from coming. They will come. The storms will come to test the foundation. The wind will come to test the structure of your life and your home. And the rain will test your covering. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. And beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended this saying that the people were astonished at his teaching. Why? For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The stars. The stars are the ones that will possess the gates of their enemies. These are soul winners. More on that later. you find it in Genesis 22, 15 to 17. We just read it. You'll be like the stars of heaven in multitude. And they will possess the gates of their enemy. If you want to know that it's relating to stars and not to sand, Genesis 24, 60. The same thing that God spoke to Abraham after he offered his son in sacrifice, they were spoken as blessings over Rebekah on his way to marry Isaac. Genesis 24, 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, May you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousand, plus multitude again. And may your descendants possess the gaze of those who hate them. So who exactly was Jesus referring to when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. He's talking 
of shining stars within the church, I will show it to you from the word of God, who carry his agenda out and stop the enemy dead in his tracks. Ask your neighbor, what type are you? Are you dust? Food for the devil? Sand? Foolish in your operations? Or star? Full of God's wisdom? What type are you? Are you a shining star? Are you a wandering star? Are you a falling star? Then big question, can stars fall? Can stars fall? Yes, they can, and surely they will. Jesus said so, that after the tribulation of those days, the stars of heaven will fall. You don't know what we are going through in different nations of the world. The stars are falling sporadically everywhere. Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. I'm not sure you, you think that's just literal sun, that's a part of the occult. Their symbol is the sun. You go to Ezekiel, they turn their back on God and they was worshiping sun from the east. And the moon will not give its light. That's some religious organization whose symbol is half crescent of the moon. You read Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, it will tell you that when the church, the true church will emerge, all those powers will be scattered. The moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's enough. Stars can fall, and stars will fall. Now let's go to the biblical portrait of shining stars, so that you know that they are not only wise, they also expand whatever God has given them for the extension of God's kingdom. They know how to sow big time into missions with their time, with their talent, with their treasure. Daniel chapter 12, verse number 3, give us the biblical portrait of shining stars. Daniel 12, 3, reads and I quote, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars for some time, for some time, for a time, have a time, and a time, forever and never. There are shining stars who will shine forever and never. They will not fall because they are turning many to righteousness. Dear brothers and sisters, from the passage just read, those who are truly wise in the sight of God are so winners. Hello? Are you wise or foolish? Those who are truly wise in the sight of God are who? So winners. Ask your neighbor, are you a soul winner? If you are not a soul winner, please don't consider yourself a wise person. Why do I say so? Just follow me. The Bible says it is the righteous who sow their tangible seed into mission, whose fruit is considered to be the same as the tree of life, that are considered wise soul winners. God can do without you to accomplish his purpose on the face of the earth, but he decided and chose to include you. So when you lock up your resources and you then set time, for God's agenda in your life, you see sinners perishing and you shut your mouth, and you are not extending what you have received from the Lord to others, you are not just a fool, you are a compound fool. Proverbs 11.30 The fruit of the righteous is what? What is it that man did not eat out of in the Garden of Eden? And God says, I'm going to give you access through your fruit. What is your fruit? It needs to be broken down so that you understand. The fruit of the righteous is what? It is your and what is this linked to? And he who wins souls is wise. is wise. So he who does not win soul is foolish. 
Why? Because of the way he uses his resources, because the fruit of the righteous is the resources that God has provided for you. I'm going to break it down for you to see in the word of God. Say with me, the fruit of the righteous, the of the righteous. is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. What is the fruit of the righteous? The fruit of the righteous is financial investments of the saints into God's kingdom, especially mission. Six different texts of scripture will make this abundantly clear to you. Let's start from Romans chapter 1. This was a church whose faith was known throughout the world. Paul said so. But he said they were lacking something. He said he was longing to see them, that he might impart unto them some spiritual gift to the end that they may be established. Not that only. He said he would need some fruit from them. By mutual faith of both the church and himself, he would need some fruit from them. He was not asking for souls. They were already born again. Their faith is known throughout the whole world. Romans 1, 8 to 15. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Their faith has become a global phenomenon. People were hearing about their faith and their faith can be seen. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Making requests if by some means now at last, I may find a way and the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some, is that good English? Some gift, some fruit. I'm bringing some gift to you, that you may be imparted, but I will need some fruit among you also, just um, among the other Gentiles. When you read that, you think he's talking about being born again. No, their faith is known throughout the world. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For what purpose? Exchange. Mutual faith. I will impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established, and then I will get some fruit from among you. What is this some fruit? Romans 15, 22 to 29. Some fruit is the resources of the believer. And when they know how to explain that wisely, especially when they disburse and release their resources towards soul winning, they not only become wise, the fruit of the righteous becomes the tree of life that Adam did not partake of. Romans 15, 22 to 29. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire this many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to do what? Amen. To minister to the saints. He was going to preach to the saints again. Huh? He was going to teach them the ABC of the gospel. No. For he pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain... I can't hear you. What is that certain contribution? Money. To make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. What? Did he call this contribution? He pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in, just in case you doubt what contribution is, material things. Therefore, when I've performed this and I've sealed to them, this fruit. Does that look at conversion of souls? 
When I've sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Whenever I presented in the past and in the present an opportunity for sowing into mission is because I want the fruit of the righteous to be credited to you so that all that the tree of life represents will be your portion. Not because we want to rob you of anything. But I know that when I come to you, if those things are in place, I'm bringing some gift. You are going to release some fruit. I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Is that all? Second Corinthians chapter number 9, 1 to 11. In fact, we should start from chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That will make it about seven texts of scripture. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God. Instead of you walking like an elephant and eating like an ant, God releases grace. He bestows grace upon you. Now, to you, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction, they took to the streets to protest. Hello? I know it's a fundamental right of citizens to protest when government is not doing what is right. That we protested before. And you're protesting now. I pray you get results better than we did. When we protested, the president climbed down and reduced the pump price. I pray that this protest will not lead to bloodbath. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That those who call themselves, themselves politicians will understand that democracy entails the freedom of citizens. And not threats. But to listen to what the citizens are saying. And to do right by them. Look at this church. In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Grace was poured upon them. You know, poor people can be extremely stingy. And so are rich people. The poor people can be very liberal too. And rich people can be liberal too. But it comes with grace. Given is a gift. Being generous is a gift. You can keep all you can and can all you have and sit on the can. It will become a can of worms. For I bear witness that according to their ability, Yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing to do what? Imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The same thing he wrote to the Romans about. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to who? To the Lord and then to us by the will of God. If you can't give yourself to God, you can't give what you have to him. And don't think it's depending on what you are going to give because it's the great provider himself. Second Corinthians 9, 1 to 11. I'm still tracing this fruit of the righteous. Now concerning the ministry to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your seal has stirred up the majority. Yet I've sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect. And as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly, we also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully, we also reap bountifully. Who is going to determine your harvest? You. So let one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make. 
I can't hear this. How many of you would like to operate in all grace? That everywhere you turn, doors open. Everywhere you turn, open heavens. Everywhere you turn, break through and not break down. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. That you will be the one telling the leader, how much do you say that thing is? 50 million. Here is it. And in case there are other things that we have not, you have not thought about, here's another 50 million. You think it cannot happen? Huh? Who is it going to happen to? As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sewer, see how it works. May he who supplies seed to the sewer and bread for food or bread to the eater, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase what? The fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriching everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. You can see the fruit of the righteous there, but let's go further. Philippians 1, we'll read from verse 1 to 11. These are partakers of the grace that Paul carried. And everything here is being geared towards ministering to the saints, to the poor saints, and releasing resources towards mission. They became his partners in reaching out to the rest of the world that God took him to. Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in CGCC. Amen. I can't hear your big amen. amen. If you want to be in that category as carriers of grace and not of labor, of favor, of God and of men, can I hear a louder amen? amen. Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in CGCC with the bishops and the kings. Grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship, that's a world partnership. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. May God bless every dominion partner, wherever they may be this morning, and pour his grace abundantly upon them for keeping the voice and the word of God alive on the airwaves in Nigeria and beyond. In the mighty name of Jesus. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. That's what we are about to set up now. We are going to set up that body that will face all the errors in the, in the body of Christ and stop them dead in their tracks. We'll call it in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Can I hear amen? amen. You all are partakers with me. Of grace. Oh, see how KJV rendered that. Give me verse 7 in KJV. Philippians 1, verse 7. Even it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. Is Paul not arrogant here? It's become his grace. But it's not for him. It's for those who connect with him. And guess what it will produce? Fruits of righteousness. They'll be wise in expending their resources. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you and with the affliction of Jesus Christ. With the affection, I beg your pardon, not affliction. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
Philippians 4, 10 to 20. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. They were the ones supplying for his necessities, necessities, ensuring that he didn't lack. You, you, you know what? Let me pause here. You know what? You know that God can bypass the crowd and raise an individual to bless his work. My wife was there. I think Pastor Desoy and his wife were there in Abuja. And I said, the cost of travel is so prohibited now. I said so myself. So can you imagine Lagos, London Lagos ticket per person club class is 13 million? We can do so many things with 13 million, but we are also called to travel. I have events in London. Next month, I'll be commissioning the new building uh, and pray for the work of my son in the faith, Dr. Dilly Oshimak India and his wife. I'll be preaching at Powerhouse International to minister to the saints there. And I look at the ticket. For me alone, it's 13 million. For my wife, it's 13 million. So I say, you know what? It's about time to turn to the children to be buying mama's ticket. She's their mother after all. I took care of my mother. And the children said, is your wife dad? You have to pay for that. I did like this. I said, okay. And I stopped there. I did not cross check or tell Dr. Jonathan David. And someone from the blues called me and said, oh, doctor sent $30,000 to you. Hello? Huh? Multiply that. By the time they changed it, it was 31 million naira. Did he cover the expenses? You think God can't do without you? I was that stupid when I was in college. Very stupid. The Lagos Varsity Christian Union was about to buy a brand new bus. I said, these little children, they have a way of just saying things that are beyond their reach. Brand new bars. And they began to contribute little by little. I did not give a dime. He said, you, you, you're wasting your time. Then I went to fellowship one afternoon. They said, brothers and sisters, the Lord has made it happen. This is the key. And the bus is parked outside. I wept all night. That day, that was the day God brought the spirit of generosity inside of me. When you think they can't do it without you, see this building where the big people who promised they would do heaven and earth, they were not here till it was finished. And it was the honest giving of you and the help of the bank that we are able to put this structure. And how many of you know that it was begun a good work here, we'll finish it. Yeah. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished. Oh, I forgot to say one more thing. Because I want you to see the connection. There was a need in a mission organization for just $2,000. That's all. After I'd complained about Ticket cost, then I took $2,000 to give it to that mission. Then I go to Lagos and say, $30,000 have been wired to you. Can you see the connection? So when you see such fertile soil, <laughs> you put your seed because you know it's going to come back. Good measure. Press down, shaking together and running over. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full, you have to learn it, and to be hungry. 
Why are you going to get hungry? Because you are depriving yourself of certain things to put into the field, into mission field. To be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You will not know when I have and you will never know when I don't. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians, you who? You Philippians, it's not, it's not a statute of general application that you can just claim and apply to yourself. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when he stepped out into the mission field, when I departed from Macedonia, no church here with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. What be times if you have to give and nobody is willing to receive? The love harvest will not go into operation except there is a giver and a receiver. For even in Thessalonica, you send aid once and again for my necessities. You call that luxury. Uh, what do you need this for? Uh, this type of toilet roll is, is too expensive. Oh, who is laughing? You know. Ah. Thank God for Lufisayo. She located some, some, you know, beautiful uh, uh, toilet roll. You, you, it, when you are removing it, it looks like velvet. The one being supplied before then, you will have to cut it and cut it and patch it. <laughs> Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit. There it is. That abounds to your account. Do you have any account in heaven today? Do you have any account as a result of your giving towards mission? Why is it written in Matthew? Do not put your resources on the earth where robbers can evade. Put it in heaven. How do you do it? Give towards mission. Indeed, I have all. The one who said, I abase, I can abound. Now say, I have all and abound. Why? He had sent money to Switzerland. He said, I am full. He had seen some of them opening up and doing the will of God. He said, now I know nothing can stop the flow. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. When last did you hear this? A sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, were pleasing to God. Epaphroditus brought gift to meet the needs of Paul, and Paul said, Now I abound. Now I have on my own ministry to my needs. Now I abound because I know it will not stop. Uh, do you understand this? He said, I am full. Now I abound. Not because I need your gift, but I've been laboring so that there will be fruit in heaven for you. And every time you have a need, God shows up. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When last did you hear about sweet smelling aroma? The day Noah offered sacrifice unto God, the day no God was smelling, God smelled a soothing aroma, and God reversed what he had said, I will no longer curse the ground for man's sake, for as long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest shall never cease. And now don't develop guilty conscience. If you have not been doing that, you can start today. You know why? Because Jesus made that sacrifice on your behalf. Ephesians chapter 5. He made it on our behalf. Don't curse anyone about tithing, about giving, about offering. Teach them to know how to connect to heaven and draw down resources of heaven like Jesus took the bread and looked up to heaven and gave it to the hands of the disciples and he multiplied. If you put the little you have in his hands, he has a way of multiplying them. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God. In KJV he said, imitators of God. Who, who, what did God do that we have to imitate? I will say it in a, in a few minutes. Be ye therefore followers of God as their children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And has given himself for us. 
as what? As an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling server. If Christ did it, you got to do it as it is, so are we in this world. Why are we going to be imitators of God? Do you know, my friends, that the greatest investment of heaven on this earth is for soul winning? Whether you see the sun or the moon or the stars, whatever he has done on this earth, the moment Adam fell, the greatest investment of heaven on this earth is purposely for soul winning. John 3, 16. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that he could come here to show you what God looks like. Huh? To walk miracles, to raise the dead, to cleanse. No! God wants all men saved. And he saved you so that you can go tell others. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. And does not come to the light. Lest his deeds should be exposed. Do you know why God sent his only begotten Son? Who became a, 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 a sweet smelling aroma for us with his sacrifice. Do you know why God did it? Because somebody also obeyed God to do it on earth. It's called draw nigh unto me and I draw nigh unto you. As far back as the days of Noah, the rains in heaven, the windows of heaven did not open until the fountains of the deep are broken to lift the Noah's ark up. Do you know that on Mount Carmel, the rain did not come until a new altar was built, and what they were looking for, 12 buckets were poured upon the sacrifice before fire fell. Do you know that if Abraham, Abraham did not give Isaac in offering to God, God would not send his own only begotten son. Hebrews eleven seventeen. It was because Abraham gave his only begotten son, and God responded by giving the greatest investment for soul winning in Christ Jesus. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, offered up. Who was there to clap for him? Who was there to be impressed by him? It was him and Isaac alone. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Why did he do that? Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. God said that, and God said, offer, offer him as one offering to me. Concluding, why did he do it? He concluded that God was able to raise him up. Even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. No wonder Paul wrote to Timothy that Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom of whom he was chief. First Timothy 1, 12 to 17. First Timothy 1, 12 to 17. And I thank Christ Jesus of our, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, extremely violent, but I obtained mercy. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the greatest investment of heaven on this earth. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I was chief. Huh? 
He still saw himself as being saved. He had saved him. He, sa he was saving him. And he will yet serve him. He had delivered him. Or he's delivering him. And he will yet deliver him. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy not to keep it to myself. That in me first, Jesus Christ must show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Stand to your feet. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. <clears throat> the entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple. We cannot be shining stars until we become soul winners. This is the greatest investment. And when we are not doing that, we are not interested in your business. So we cannot cry to you to be interested in our business. Lord, I pray that this day, this world will become real into these people. It will be birthed in their spirit. And they will go everywhere, extending the frontiers of your kingdom, given their resources of time, of talent, of treasure towards soul winning. Thank you, Father, for in this house will be many shining stars and the firmament of the church and of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I will continue with the differences between the stars, the shining stars, the wandering stars, and the falling stars next Sunday. Oh, I know it's youth meeting. Uh, this is important. There cannot be enduring faith except you begin to do what is expected of you. I love you. Good morning.